Um, this session, I'm happy to introduce the group that attended the and were featured speakers at the mainstreaming virtual world learning colloquium, uh, which was held last weekend. Um, our featured speakers included Joyce Betancourt, Cynthia Colon, Valerie Hill, Krista Lopez, Eileen O'Connor, Andrew Stricker, Barbara Truman, and Rachel Uman. Um, I'm Kay McLennan. Professor of Practice and Director of Online Learning at Tulane School of Professional Advancement. The colloquium was uh, something that I originated and applied for funding from the uh, Carol Lab and Bernicke Faculty Fund and received funding uh, from this fund and my School of Professional Advancement. So it was held in the Avicon grid as a community event, add-on to this OSCC 18 event. And the impetus for this uh, colloquium has to do with the fact that OpenSIM has been an excellent fit for educators to use to stage immersive learning environments. And the key features that make OpenSIM uh, a perfect fit for educators include low hosting costs, in-world building tools, the ability to safeguard student identities, the ability to save and reuse simulators, and more. Yet, the use of virtual learning simulators in OpenSIM are not mainstream in higher education. They're not even mainstream in institutions that offer them. I, I, can, I say this uh, myself. Uh, it's offered in my courses, but only about a third of the students volunteer to be part of the virtual learning activities. So in an effort to see if there is any way to refocus attention onto this terrific uh, uh, simulator platform, um, the colloquium was born. So each of the speakers were asked to uh, ponder how, and to discuss how they're currently using virtual world learning simulations, how their use differs from past use, what they think is needed to expand the use of 3D learning simulations, and what they predict in the way of uh, simulations. Um, for my contributions, both current and future, uh, my suggestions include uh, to educators and others in 3D virtual world platforms to use simulations both in-world and out-of-world. I've had a lot of success uh, videotaping case studies uh, and then using them in our learning management system. Also, uh, the only featured presenter that wasn't able to make it here today is Valerie Hill. And she is uh, sponsoring and working on a virtual world database. So with Valerie's work in mind, consider sharing your content and tutorial creations with the educator community. Also, um, I'm presenting with two colleagues from Tulane first thing tomorrow morning about virtual machine software, where my colleagues have enabled me to offer students the use of virtualized viewers where they can uh, enter the virtual world and participate in simulations from uh, any mobile device, including their mobile phone. And finally, uh, what I'd like to leave the group with is for the group to consider addressing the need for a single sign-on into OpenSIM from learning management systems. We've heard a lot of discussion about uh, new viewers, and I just would like the new viewer to be API or LTI and be able to be integrated into uh, uh, our learning management systems. I have this vision of myself and students just stepping off the page with our avatars. So with that as the backdrop, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Rachel Uman is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington in Seattle. Thank you so much, Kay, and thank you all for being here. I'm so delighted to give a brief summary of um, 
our conversations at the colloquium, which were very productive. So as Kay mentioned, I work at the University of Washington in Seattle. I'm a pediatrician who also takes care of babies who are newborns. And so one of the key focuses of uh, our group there is to improve newborn outcomes. And uh, after I got there, I made sure that their mission included technology. And so we have... Um, a focus not just on simulation-based training that uses mannequins, but we are also using virtual simulations. And in the simulation world, uh, I think it's not new, and we all know that simulations have been used for years in aviation and military, I think, you know, in, in space. Uh, it, those are actually reasonably mainstream. Um, what has been lagging behind, I think, in medical training has just been, uh, you know, being able to translate what we are using in the mannequins and in the labs to the virtual environment. So that is an area that we have set out to try to improve on. And in addition, I know we were thinking about how we use simulations for training healthcare providers, not just in high resource settings, but also in low resource settings. And I think that is where Open Simulator and Open Simulator technology could be really powerful. So I just want to say that, you know, where we use simulations, we can use virtual environments. Um, there's very little that's discrepant or different from the educational standpoint um, between writing a simulation for the mannequin and writing a simulation for the virtual world. So that's the message that we have been trying to communicate to our group um, with some success. And so we have a VR um, AR lab now at the University of Washington. Uh, it's embedded within the neonatal section. And we're experimenting with lots of different types of sims and different types of programs. So Kay mentioned then and now. So virtual worlds then, uh, if you might recall, before I moved to Seattle, I was working in Indiana, and there we were doing the Africa Traveler series with the Global Health Sim that I think many of you to visit. Um, and then we also had a public health simulation that we were using to explore just the differences in outcomes between uh, urban and a suburban setting for public health students that were doing um, an MD and MPH program. So those kind of set the stage for me um, because from there we did some teamwork training and we were able to develop a prototype for healthcare providers doing teamwork training and um, use that prototype to collect some preliminary data uh, that we were later able to translate into a grant application. So being able to use Open Simulator as a prototyping tool I think is something that we of all, uh, or many of us have done, um, and use that as kind of a stepping stone to translating, you know, various uh, simulations you know, to larger audiences. Now, I mean, I think while we all know the benefits, and I think we've all experienced the positives of you using Open Simulator, um, some of the challenges have not completely gone away. Um, one of which. Uh, Kay mentioned, you know, being able to connect or interface with the learning management system in order to collect that kind of checkoff data for what the learner has been able to do in Open Simulator. Um, the other aspect is just access, you know, being able to access a simulation easily either on a phone or on an iPad or on, you know, Presumably on the laptop without multiple steps um, is really important. So, at least for our 
user audience. <laughs> so the other message I think I wanted to share is, you know, knowing your audience is really important. Um, and I think we recognize pretty early that while medical providers are smart, um, they have very low patience for any tech issues. And so your audience matters quite a bit. Um, I'll say one or two more things because I know that we, I don't have a, a lot of time and I'm on call also. <laughs> so the phone that's ringing in the background um, is probably for me. Uh, but I, I'd like to say that uh, our success has really been in finding applicable areas to collaborate on with other faculty. So doing going it alone is neither fun nor productive in academics. And so you know, we, I've collaborated with faculty that um, you know, are interested in disaster simulations. I've collaborated with faculty that are interested in, uh, you know, creating a tool for um, transport teams to use for practice. Um, we've done a simulation that, you know, involved prenatal counseling. Uh, and just, you know, different people are interested in different things. So as an educator um, or a researcher, you may have an opportunity to kind of get a little bit out of your comfort zone, try something new, reach a different audience, and thereby expand your influence or expand your reach. So we've been looking for areas where a virtual worlds can be inserted as a component of a larger project, so for t training or testing. Um, and with advances in graphics cards, I, you know, again, having had to buy computers, you know, to run other types of uh, VR, if you put up OpenSim on a high-end computer, it looks great. So, you know, the concerns about graphics and fidelity of graphics are really going away, I think, you know, as people have better you know, um, improved systems. So I will leave you with just one final thought and just to encourage you to write about your projects. So the Journal of Virtual Studies uh, is one that has a practical application section, but there are also other journals that, you know, like, um, uh, you know, mainstream journal, well, I won't say journal virtual studies, of course it's a mainstream journal, but other journals that are more subject focused that would still welcome a virtual project. So simulation journals, um, journals that, you know, deal with education and educational teaching methods. I think the more we get the message out, regardless of the tools that we're using, the more people will welcome this as just another way to learn. Thank you, Thank Rachel. You. And I just want to call everyone's attention to Rachel's presentation tomorrow afternoon at 2.30, I believe, uh, Pacific time. Um, yes. Our, our next featured speaker is Barbara Truman. Barbara is a faculty member teaching graduate students as well as a researcher at the University of Central Florida in uh, Orlando. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you, Kay. Yeah, it was such a pleasure last week to get together and share some insights that all of us have been working on. You know, and part of what I shared was my involvement at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. Previously, I had been a faculty administrator where I had responsibility for all kinds of decision making regarding the implement the, cho the choosing and the implementation of learning technologies. And then to some degree, the information systems that enabled those learning technologies. And if any of you know anything about the University of Central Florida is that it has been a focal point of extreme growth in the Orlando area. So we were right in the middle of the hot seat where we had to um, we had to reduce seat time on our campus because there was no way we could we could build brick and mortar fast enough. But I always wanted to get involved in 3D immersive environments, mm -hmm. you know, and I had I had seen I had participated in all kinds of professional associations to try to learn from what others were doing at other campuses so that we could kind of bring the best back and make some good choices. 
the New Media Consortium is where I first saw Cynthia Colloin doing these presentations. And it, it planted a seed in me to want to follow up and learn from her. So I was very fortunate to get my doctorate degree through Colorado Tech and, and met Andy Stricker as well through that process. So I, I really feel like I've learned from the best as, as I have um, gone through my progress from um, being on the teaching and learning side, I've, I've met other people and tried to learn how to do the grant research. This is where I met Rachel. And uh, we met in a virtual world first, but then we worked on a project. We wrote a grant together. Unfortunately, it wasn't funded and uh, to the degree that we were hoping. But um, it, it was extraordinarily valuable to me as professional development. So there is no way I can go back to the traditional associations where they have their phone calls in their webinars, in their once a year face-to-face -face conferences, sometimes twice a year. There's no way I can go back and participate like that. I find that these environments are an incubator. They are an accelerator. They save lots of money. And one of the big things I came away with last week was where I saw an intersection of three themes based on our speakers. And, and this is very exciting to me moving forward. We heard from Valerie Hill. She talked all about digital citizenship and meta literacies and, and um, in empowering all these learners and really trying to catalog all these resources that are available to help uh, faculty, teachers, campuses with some of the decision making of what's going on. There's a huge role for the libraries to play in this um, emerging space. I also heard um, Krista talking about the need to support the climate. So climate stewardship was an incredible theme that I came away with. And then from uh, some of my previous research and also with working with Andy Stricker with the Air Force, um, looking at how to integrate the information systems, moving towards smart city, smart community, smart campus, eventually artificial intelligence. So how, you know, the, the core developers come up with the protocols and the standards that will enable us to have a platform, I can see where we can combine our efforts across these three areas. And it, it will, it could be the most transformational impact that we could have um, on higher education at least and then hopefully back to secondary education as well but it, it's also the opportunity to work across the domains that's been one of the uh, activities that i have really tried to figure out how to do is how to work with the military how to translate some of the research that they have done um, lots of times on effectiveness and, and then bring that back for academia and then try to, to figure out how to uh, get industry uh, working where it will be able to find the collaborative interest so that they'll share. But then, you know, we're kind of forming these, uh, this uh, a consortia where together we can solve a lot of these challenges that individually at our campuses, there's no way we can. So that, that's what I would just like to leave you with. That's what I came away with last week. And I'm really excited moving forward to um, trying to connect some of the research with the National Science Foundation and some of the other uh, associations that I've been involved in to try to move that agenda forward. Thank you. Bar Barbara, thank you. That was a terrific summary. Um, our next uh, featured speaker is Andrew Stricker. Andrew is an instructional architect at Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. Welcome, Andrew. Hi. Uh, yes, I've, I've been very honored to spend several years working with many of you and exploring 
what the, are the possible is with these kinds of environments. The Air Force is fascinated with the means to improve on the levels of engagement and interactivity and meaningfulness. You know, those those three parts uh, is our our secret sauce for how we're developing our airmen for the future. You know, we're, you know as I mentioned uh, earlier today, you know, the future that we're dealing with is very complex. Uh, you know, the, the challenges are spanning multiple dimensions of issues, and we're wanting our, our airmen to be really capable of adapting, uh, you know, as best as they can to changing circumstances. So, so a lot of the research uh, around, uh, you know, human intelligence and development uh, and how you develop people over a lifespan uh, to be um, uh, facile with change and capable of, of dealing with high levels of uncertainty is has been right at the heart of my work. And so uh, Cynthia and Barbara have have been associated with our efforts with the Air Force for uh, over a decade at least. And mm-hmm. we've been bringing, uh, you know, great insights from people because, you know, they're, they're kindred uh, spirits with each of you with their belief in collaborative efforts, you know. And I think, uh, um, you know, each of you have already spoken about the power of collaboration. Well, well everything that we're doing, uh, you know, benefits from – Um, you know, design thinking that um, uh, we use as our core methodology. You know, we bring people from across uh, industry, military communities, and higher education institutions into these very high, intense, rapid prototyping efforts. You know, the Department of Defense has put together several innovation hubs at Silicon Valley, up at Boston, and Las Vegas, and Austin, and we've got one in my location, Air University, and you know we're so what we've done is we we've we've invested in this kind of a model to uh, you know figure out ways to really enhance uh, you know the applications of virtual reality environments, and so you know I'm a cognitive scientist by by education and, and background, and so you know the things I'm trying to do is is you know, how do we create these kind of intense scenario-based simulations that really uh, uh, capture people's imagination? And when they get into these environments, they're compelling. And they, they understand the power of learning together, problem-solving together, and, and forming a connected network of people that go outside of their particular areas of, uh, you know, where they work, you know. So, for example, we're encouraging our military faculty to get into these environments and and be connected with other faculty across several institutions and and organizations. Um, So far, what we've done with our open simulator work uh, with the Air Force, you know, we we process, uh, well, hundreds of students through some of our prototypes, and so they do test um, the uh, the the robustness of Open Sim, uh, and I and I absolutely agree about the power of uh, single sign-on. We we had a single sign-on environment uh, at one of our schools for uh, captains, and um, um, but when it came to Open Simulator, we we had to you know uh, feed in that information. Uh, um, and so if it would be wonderful to have like uh, learning interoperability. Uh, uh, standards applied for how we could, you know, connect in various learning management systems into these kinds of uh, platforms. Uh, I'm not too worried about that. I think I think that will come. Uh, I'm just very excited to have the means to uh, have the environment like Open Simulator, where faculty directly can contribute to the design build process. You know, I, I've been I've been associated with various uh, National Science Foundation, National Academy uh, of Sciences uh, programs where they've emphasized that the real uh, engine behind innovation in our universities is getting faculty directly involved in the creation of these kinds of learning scenarios and simulations. Uh, and, and so, 
um, you know, you know, I don't, I don't think uh, Barbara or, or Cynthia, you would, you would disagree at all, right? Everything we've done, it's, it's been uh, uh, in, involved uh, faculty, and in many cases, students, students have been right there with us, contributing. You know, what a wonderful way to learn, right? When you're actually creating and building. Uh, and, and, and showing how well you understand something by the models you construct, right? And and then and then being able to bring others in uh, to actually uh, give you informed insight about um, your model. And I know Cynthia, you've you've used those techniques in your classes many many times. And so, but so much of what I see about everything I've seen at your conference and 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 what Tulane has put together is is just right in line with some of the best research we have about how people learn and, and what we want to try to do uh, for the next generation of learners coming into our institution. So thanks for the opportunity to share today. Andrew, thank you. Our next speaker is Eileen O'Connor. Uh, Eileen is an associate professor at the SUNY Empire State College. And she's got a big presentation uh, after this later in the day today. So thank you for stopping by uh, to give us a little bit of an overview of your presentation from last weekend. Okay, well, and thank you, Kay. Um, are you, can you hear me well enough? Just want to be sure. Yes, okay, um, yes thank you. Oh, um, well, you know, I'm very much enjoying hearing everyone speak and feeling a little left out myself because I tend to work uh, in a rather isolated fashion. So I'll give you my story and um, hope to get much more involved with others. Um, I came out of IBM back in the 1980s, but I was actually in IBM opened a science division in 1980. I was a chemist. So I came in that way, uh, got into Big Blue, and that was as computers were really just starting up. And so uh, on a personal computing level, um, became very involved, took a buyout, though, at the end of the 80s and moved to upstate New York and uh, went back for a doctorate, combining my interest in science and my interest in technology. And uh, at the same time, I had a son-in-law who spent days in um, virtual spaces, war games, World of Warcraft, that type of thing. And I started to say, why aren't educators using these spaces? So that became my initial desire to see what was so involving and seductive about these environments. And um, what I then went through my own journey, uh, getting out of school, working for RPI for a while in engineering school, where I was able to see programmers sitting there working on developing games, wanting to get them myself. So, um, I, I remember naively saying, well, I'm going to make some kind of a deal with Nintendo. You know, they have all of these game engines and areas like that. Uh, but then I never had time to pursue it. And I started working for SUNY Empire State College about 15 years ago. So I always had that in the back of my head. Now, I was in the graduate program in science education initially. And what happened was along the way, the school itself, SUNY, um, got a grant to bring in Second Life. And so what they actually did was had money to make a beautiful island. And if you come late at the end of the day, you'll see more pictures on that. But they began with some help from artists to create some very lovely spaces. And they went to faculty. Now I'm in an online program. I teach 100% online. Uh, we did have some scenarios early on where we actually worked with some K-12 schools, but I was mostly teaching people who would become K-12 teachers, and then um, the program broadened later to bring in more corporate developers, etc. cetera. Um, but it was seeing Second Life that got me interested. Now, we had help initially, and there were um, wonderful tech support people who would come in and help us, and artists who would make things. And if any of you know, if you're a science person, and my master's is in engineering, um, I have no artistic skill. So I created spaces, but I was willing to work in the virtual spaces. I seem to have that scientific tolerance to failure. You know, I was quite willing to keep on failing. And I knew from being involved with computers since the 1970s that 
they would always make create problems, but they created great possibilities. So I stayed with Second Life, um, making things and bringing my classes into them. Now I had online classes, so I followed through the usual ups and downs of having some support for a while. Then the number of faculty that got involved, although they offered this to uh, a number of faculty, they're really just two or three of us who stayed involved with virtual reality. And I loved it. I was able to bring my students together. We had, I used it mostly as a community space. And we would have meetings. We would have the regular online courses and assignments. But we would meet together and have discussions. It was an amazing way to build community. And I started looking that at that as my research area. Then what happened, as you all know, it became too expensive for Second Life. The school stopped supporting it which actually opened a lot of venues for me when I discovered open source. And so I will always thank the folks here for giving me that opportunity. And what open source gave me was not only the ability, and I'm a big Kitely person, I'm not smart enough to run all of these things myself. I basically am an independent. I don't work with support from the school. I, you know, rent my own server space and I get nods that that's Eileen's research area. So, you know, it's they don't poo-poo it, but they don't support me. So um, Kitely really had a wonderful, stable platform. I was able to get a lot of um, Creative Commons materials, and I put together my own islands. And also, I'd like to share with the group, I made many, many tutorials. One of my jobs way back at IBM was technical writer. So, you know, I needed to teach how to use these spaces Eventually, we went into a master's program in emerging technology, and um, all of my tutorials are what my students use. And if you learn, you know, I don't want to take too long, the, we've had over 30 students create their own islands. But the challenges are still there. I'm glad to work with students, um, but we, they tend to be sort of solo islands. We really need to, uh, within the school, move to a higher level um, I see myself rather scattered, you know, so you know we have to teach a lot of different courses. And I think as Kay was saying, I wish I taught only in virtual reality, but I don't. I have to deal with many, many other types of technologies. So there's the learning, there's bringing the students in, uh, and there's still a lot of resistance among faculty. I have stay below the radar. Literally, I stay below the radar to not make waves if people sense you're doing something outside the box that they may eventually have to do, it can be kind of disastrous in terms of moving through the system. Now, I am tenured now, so I'm not as worried, but um, there's resistance there. The other thing, too, is because I'm online, I can, so to speak, make my students come to these assignments, to these meetings. Um, But what they run into the challenge nowadays, if you try to download something like Firestorm, Uh, There are a lot of blocks put in by institutions, and I have found that instructional designers have not been as helpful as I wish they would be. You know, I basically tell them I'm my my own tech support, but they haven't always helped. So my students who work from home at their own computers are able to get into Firestorm, use Firestorm and get into my islands, but there are institutional problems if they're trying to come in from a school or something, and even my fellow faculty members, when they're in their physical offices, often can't get into these spaces. So there's there's a lot of challenges just in terms of using the technology. But I think Eileen, I, yeah, that that's terrific. Um, uh, what a wonderful overview. Um, and again, we're going to come back to Eileen uh, this afternoon. So I encourage everyone to uh, stop by her second presentation today. Um, Our next speaker is Krista Lopez, a professor at the University of California, Irvine, uh, as well as an open simulator core developer and the originator and developer of the hypergrid. Thank you, Krista, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, So uh, let me just uh, tell you what I talked about in the immersive learning symposium last week. Uh, It's not so much about the uh, using these environments for um, educational purposes for related 
topic that uh, in universities we are very well aware, which is for, for these kinds of things, meetings and conferences, and uh, that is an inherent part of of getting people together somehow. And um, there's a lot of uh, of meetings and conferences in uh, in you know in higher related to higher education. Um, so much so that we f fly a lot. We tend to go to conferences all over the world uh, to se several times a year. Um, there seems to be this sort of uh, association between, you know, if you are successful, you are supposed to travel a lot, which is a really bad incentive. But, it, you know, th that's how that's how things have been going. So uh, a few of us in a... Um, group that I'm associated with, uh, the ACM, and in particular the special interest groups in programming languages, we have been kind of thinking about um, about this issue of uh, flying so much and uh, and contributing to climate, uh, to, to, to the planet warm, warming up, basically. Uh, maybe we should, it, it turns out that a long distance flight is one of the major components for, uh, it's not a major, but it's a, it's a big chunk of uh, of a contributor for global warming. Uh, our airplanes are um, really wasteful. Um, so we have been kind of brainstorming about other ways that we could conduct our business as usual that that, that is you know, going to conferences and attending conferences so many uh, times a, a year. And we've been going through a bunch of uh, options, you know, many of them, uh, some of them are sort of low-hanging fruit, like carbon offsets. Others would be a little bit more radical. It would need to change in our culture somehow. And of course, the most radical of all would be to um, to have, to move the physical conferences into something like this that we're having here right now. So I don't need to talk to you about virtual conferences. I think you all are sold on that idea. We, we have all experienced these, uh, these events online. I, think you are repeating, many of you are repeating the experience. It's really an engage, it can be an engaging experience. Uh, so, uh, the, 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 what I was kind of trying to make an argument is that there is a strong argument for investing in these environments and in, in this technology um, with, with the idea that we need to decrease long distance travel because of global warming, because of carbon emissions. And so I was trying to give everybody else an extra boost, an extra argument for when you are competing for funding for education uh, on these environments or uh, meetings, virtual meetings, that uh, hooking up to the idea that we need to reduce travel is perhaps a good a good way to go at it. So I was trying to steer some enthusiasm among the participants there to see if we could somehow get get together and get some funding to develop uh, and the next generation of viewers, which I think, as you, I've been telling you all all day long, is the the weakest link in all this all this uh, ecosystem. So that, that that that's it in a nutshell. Um, Crystal, I, thank you. Yep. And I, hopefully we'll have a few minutes left over for questions. Um, uh, moving us along, Cynthia Colon is our next uh, speaker, a featured speaker. Uh, she's a professor at Colorado Technical University. Thank you, Sin, for joining us. Thank you, Kay. Let's see. <laughs> I had written out some notes, but we won't worry about those. Uh, I've, I've taught 52 university classes in virtual worlds. And to me, that's the way to go. But here's why. It's not just about university classes. It's not just about formal education. It's about the fact that all of us need to learn and that we have this burden. Uh, the world is constantly changing. It's constantly complex. And everything we do requires us to keep moving forward. So when students come into this world, all of a sudden there's an intimacy that occurs. Because um, I work with them synchronously as well as asynchronously, right? So we meet. We simulate that face-to-face -face meeting that Krista just talked about that's so valuable, right? And yet, we don't see our faces. We see our avatars, our emotions. We drag content to our bodies, to each other's bodies. All of my students create content 
even though they have zero virtual world building skills, okay? And it's because I believe in the power of creation. The reason I love these spaces and OpenSim in particular is because um, my students can come in and create. And without that power of creation, they don't form a connection to the content. It isn't personal, right? And I don't mean that they're creating things that they're studying. Sometimes what they create models their ideas in strange and wonderful ways, right? And so it takes them to new levels. I know our time is short, so I'll wrap up. I'll be speaking again at 3.30 on the Deep Immersion panel, and I'll talk about it then. But students like Barbara are so inspiring to me because they, they don't leave. They don't stop learning as soon as class is done or they graduate. They don't disappear. We still we form connections that matter, and we continue the work. And um, that, to me, is the future of learning in virtual worlds. Cynthia, thank you. That was well said. Um, Joyce Betancourt is uh, our uh, final speaker today, um, featured speaker. Joyce is founder, creative director of Avacon, and of course the nonprofit Commons in Second Life. And uh, Avacon enabled our colloquium last uh, weekend. I don't know how we would have done it without them. Joyce, thank you for taking a few minutes out today to talk to us. You're welcome. Um, yes. Uh, so uh, I actually did load a couple slides for my presentation, but I will I'll go pretty quick because I know we only have a few minutes um, and hopefully I can get them to go. Actually, I'll talk cause until Franz uh, picks up my slides maybe. Um, but either way, so um, to to sort of um, to sort of start where my where I was where I was uh, uh focusing it on during the, the colloquium last week. You know, I kind of started off with um, uh, with my background and initially it was with, um, um, it started actually off in the teen grid of Second Life. Um, if um, many of you can kind of go back to that um, uh, with, the, with the educational nonprofit, um, Global Kids, and um, the work we were doing with um, uh, it was it, it was it was great work. We you know were funded from MacArthur Foundation's Digital Media and Learning. So a lot of the the touch points that like Barbara said with like um, digital media literacy is really being a huge topic and and using spaces like virtual worlds and game spaces. And um, uh, from from there, and 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 um, though the virtual world environments, as we all know, are very powerful for education. You know, we'd we'd uh, you'd be teaching the teaching. Uh, these were often high school age students. You'd be teaching them. You'd go away and come back, and suddenly there'd be a whole city build that they would have made over the weekend. Um, so the the ability and the excitement to actually work in the space was great, but they weren't practical in the fact that. It was, it was very limited, even more limited as uh, than what we think of Second Life. The Teen Grid was much worse, um, and uh, and then it kind of evolved, you know, from there. But certainly, we we worked on a lot of uh, complex builds, and even had the teens uh, uh, designing uh, the experiences and building as well. Um, and that uh, that kind of led to doing. Um, to doing sort of, oh, here we go, that's for that. Um, and that kind of led to doing events sort of like what's here on the slide where um, we were combining lots of multiple virtual worlds at once. Uh, um, here is Yville, there.com, a second life, teen second life was also this, and this was a particular event from the United Nations uh, where Kofi Annan was receiving an award. Um, so we would do these complex sort of bring everybody together, but still wasn't, it, it was great, but it was really hard for each of those words, worlds to connect uh, to connect or talk to each other, um, and also um, from the from the from the doing this point of view, uh, you you know there wasn't uh, import and export in the same way that we have here, so it kind of was limited in regards to what each of these particular events uh, meant for connecting both content and people. Um, and then um, I you know I went further on to some of the the. Um, kind of instructional uh, design um, uh, and educational technology stuff when this particular one was with, uh, working with a, the American Museum of Natural History and the challenges of uh, uh, bringing, bringing uh, students in in a very tight um, time frame and, uh, and working within the frameworks of uh, 
what the UI, uh, back to the whole viewers thing, what the UI was so that way you could quickly teach people how to interact and build. Uh, in this case, this was a, um, a, a uh, archaeologic, uh, an archaeological um, uh, project on um, prehistoric aquatic life. Um, and uh, getting students, we, ha you know, you, we actually had to kind of um, hack the build tools in what we had to be able to create this, um, and, and, and which could be much easily done if, you know, in some of the ways that we've talked about modular viewers um, here and, and uh, but certainly, you know, was that. Um, and this kind of comes into the now. Uh, so Primland is actually in the Avicon grid. Um, and uh, another thing that stems back to the teen second life and global kids days is we actually had put together a an open source uh, Creative Commons curriculum. And um, uh, with that, we we allowed people to remix it and folks were uh, uh, um, sort of redistributing it, uh, mixing it up with, with um, ma uh, learning management system software stuff. Um, and Primland is the open simulator reincarnation. We took that up again and uh, remixed it. So now it's a whole, um, uh, or that you can actually walk through, learn how to build. Um, and uh, and Avicon's really been sort of focusing on how, trying to get these resources um, out to um, out to the um, the community. So we'll, we'll be we offer things like this too. And I'll, I'll just kind of wrap up with um, Kay brought up nonprofit commons. Um, so nonprofit commons obviously is a big piece of it, and that really brings me to kind of like moving from the educational space to like this sort of larger community. And how do you how do you support those uh, in in virtual environments? Um, and um, uh, Avacon did that initially by organizing the Second Life Community Com conventions, uh, and then. Um, uh, moved that over to uh, that same paradigm to um, supporting uh, specific communities like Nonprofit Commons. Um, this is a particular one from SLCC. Uh, a physical conference, to, to Krista's point, much more complicated, takes up a lot of resources, costs a lot more money um, than what we have here. Um, and um, that ultimately leaves us to things like Open Simulator, where we have um, you know, where we have the event we have today and being able to support a community uh, in a broader, in a broader way. Um, uh, and one that we have much more um, control and portability of our, um, our educational and other assets and, and uh, learning. So that's it. Joyce, thank you. What a perfect place to, to stop right where we're back at the today's conference. Um, thank you panelists for a terrific presentation. <laughs> I've, I've been getting the high sign about running out of time, uh, so I'm uh, guessing we don't have time for questions. But uh, we please... can probably take a couple just because oh, we're great. after this. We have a break, so we probably can go right to the hour. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, please type your questions into the chat, and while you're doing that, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give the a little bit of the announcement for uh, the next session. We have a break. And our next session will begin at 3.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time here in this auditorium. It's the State of Immersion, Tales of Frontline, uh, Tales of, Frontline of Learning, Research, and Engagement. Um, we also encourage you to visit the OSCC 18 Poster Expo in OSCC Expo Region 3. And uh, uh, again, uh, let's take a look and see what we've got here in the way of questions. Sin, uh, all, uh, you are so adept at uh, monitoring the chat. Do you see anything in the questions? You know, I haven't. I did have a few questions that came in through whispers, and I was answering them <laughs> as they went on. <laughs> but um, and, and you have to realize our ability to have privacy and to be vocal publicly is, is a very great gift. And that's the back channel is really important. And I love the fact that it's built into the tool, right? We don't have to go to Twitter or Facebook or anywhere else, MeWe, uh, to have this back channel and to, and to do this sharing. So I love that. But I want to thank you for bringing us together because I think that's very powerful. And, and I, I look forward to our next collaboration. I agree, and I hope that, that this becomes an annual event, uh, you know, piggybacking uh, onto the OSCC events. I do see one question from Buffy. 
Um, she asks, where do we see a virtual world heading for the future? Will there still be an open sim or a second life? Well, I can't speak for Second Life, but I know Open Sim is alive and well and uh, going to be around for some time to come. And anybody, any of our panelists, please jump in to answer Buffy's question. Well, for the Air Force, uh, we are definitely um, excited for the future of Open Sim and, and what it represents with open source and the community of engagement uh, and developers and, and end users. So from the Air Force perspective, we see a long future. Well, thank you, everyone. And now a short break, and we'll all be back again. And you're going to see Rachel and Sin and Barbara and uh, so many of our speakers uh, back again uh, for more sessions at this conference. Thank you for attending.